probably may, may be the only time that I ever mention him this evening. It's the only time that he really does need to be mentioned. But I'm just so happy that Donald Trump is the president. Because <laughs> guess what? Good morning, America. Wake up call. This is a wake up call. Yes. Good morning. Okay, we needed this. Because, you know, when we've been trying to, I've been trying to, all of us have been trying to tell the community, hey, listen, we better get this thing together here. We better get our economics together here. We better start doing something here. That's right. People sleep. Between uh, 2004 and 2008, I was doing excursions to Chicago, and I was doing work uh, developing um, curriculum in Chicago, working with different organizations. And there was a group of brothers and sisters that used to travel from Indianapolis to come to uh, Chicago. And long story short, because I really want to get to the point, is that they were uh, taken back. And so what they did is they developed a, a 14 minute uh, DVD uh, in celebrating the um, presidency of uh, the candidacy and the presidency of President Barack Obama. But the way in which they approached it was not so much celebrating President Barack Obama, but all of the people in our history that made his election possible. And so there was an entire view of the ascendancy of President Barack Obama to the presidency, but building on the shoulders that he sat on to get there. They called me and asked me if I would be willing to assist them in developing a curriculum for the uh, Indianapolis public schools. I said, sure. I spent about four or five years, and still I go back to continue my staff development with them. But, long story short, this is the curriculum. See, when I, when, see family, when I come to you, I want to come to you with something. I'm, I'm not into talk. So when I say that there's a curriculum out here that can teach our children their culture and at the same time meet the mathematical standards, or the science standards, or the language art standards. And I'm going to go through one particular lesson plan here. But I just want to show you that my part is half the book, along with my curriculum methodology, is how it went through. But, and, I, and, I, and I'll show you what it looks like as time goes on. There was a lesson plan recently that I worked on that literally See, see, there's so much about us that's so wonderful and so great, but we just don't know it. This lesson plan is titled, The Hands That Built the White House Built the Pyramids. And what it does, I trace the history using the, the, the scholarship of people like Sheikh Amdi Dia and other scholars showing how when Africans were either at war or just moving across the continent, the ones on the Nile Valley, the one on the Hapi Valley, they veered off west and towards the 500 BCs, the Assyrians started coming in and started chasing Africans away from the east coast. And they started traveling northwest and North Africa. The early peoples would develop the people we now know as the Dogon, the Senegal, the ones in Morocco, the one in Mauritania, so that the pyramid technology that came up out of Kush, that came up into Kemet, began to travel west. And so when we study the Dogon of Mali, we're studying the history, the scholarship that would have moved itself across into West Africa. It'll go straight across Nigeria to Ghana, straight to uh, Senegal, Gambia. The technology is then Africans are going to travel from west back to east. And there's going to see, we don't know there was a lively trade in northwest Africa. That's only been a desert for about 10,000 years at most. There was a time that was grassland. What we call the Sahara once was grassland. When, uh, when the Ice Age occurred, there was very heavy rains in North Africa. Africa didn't have an ice age. It just had very heavy rains. 
when the rains came down at such phenomenal amounts, the grasslands that was fruitful got, got soaked with water. The hot sun then destroyed the land, became a desert. But for thousands of years, what we call the Sahara Desert was plush land, lush greenery. But what's interesting is there's a brother named Yosef Ben Levi who has researched Sahara and has shown that there are literally underground tunnels that link East Africa to West Africa. And that when they would be traveling, because remember they had a lively trade, they didn't want to give up the trade. So what they did is they built these tunnels to be able to go underground to avoid the heat and the desert. And when they would come up, they would come up and they built, what do we call them? Oases. Hmm. Little cities where they could get water and fruit and vegetables. And then on their way back, they would go back down in the tunnel and go across. Upon which the subway system studied to be able to build an underground <laughs> system and the sewer system too. Wow. Hmm. See, we don't know how great we are. Mm -hmm. And I ask you, don't believe me. That's it. My job isn't to make you believe me. My job is to make us think. Mm -hmm. Get us up out of this box of white supremacy. To think that they did all that, they didn't do any of those things. Mm -hmm. There are areas where they may have improved, but they didn't invent a thing. In fact, the only thing that white folk invented was the patent office. Because they took everybody else's ideas and put their name on it. So, say yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's it. That's it. So this lesson plan explores, because you know, it was black folk. You heard Michelle Obama say, it was black folk built the White House. But not just that, it was black folk that built up Boston. It was black folk built up Philadelphia. Wall Street. Wall Street. Washington, D.C. Okay, we can go through that. The architect of, of Washington, D.C. was a brother, Benjamin Banneker. When we trace his lineage, he goes back to the Dogon people. There's a book called uh, um, uh, Benjamin Banneker by Charles Cerami, C-E-R-A-M-I. There's a chapter in there that talks about his Dogon ancestors. But why would that make sense? What are the Dogon so famous for? Yeah. Agriculture and astronomy. And what built Washington, D.C.? See, they try to give the credit uh, uh, to uh, Pierre Enfant. But they kicked him out, because he, he, he was crazy. So they kicked him out. The person that built Washington, D.C. was not just an engineer. L'Enfant's job was to be an engineer. Whoever built Washington, D.C. had to have been an astronomer. Because it's laid out according to the way Giza is laid out. When you go to the Capitol, have you ever tried to call somebody or, or, or write a letter to somebody in D.C.? What do you have to include in that address when you write somebody in D.C.? Northwest, Southwest. Southwest. That's it. Northwest, Southwest, Southeast, North. Why? Because the Capitol Correct. building is the rotund pyramid of Washington, D.C. It actually sits on the cardinal point of the planet. Hmm. That's why when you write somebody, you can have a Ninth Street, NW Northwest, you could have a 9th Street Southeast because the address is determined by where you are according to the Capitol building. And then you run that whole area from the Capitol building straight on down to Lincoln Memorial. Okay? You can find all those buildings straight up in the African tradition. Go to Kemet, you'll see those temples there. Those are all temples. That reflecting pond goes right back to Karnak, the Temple of Karnak. For those of you who have been there, you see? So that when you're looking at the people who built D.C. or Boston, or we are the ancestors of the Kemetic Pyramid Builders. Because the builders of the pyramids ended up in Senegal. When they ended up in Senegal and then they were stolen and brought to America, those are our ancestors. You see? So we have a direct connection to Kemet. And so this lesson plan is dealing with that concept. Not to mention the city in Nigeria that they found, Eredo. E-R-E-D-O, Eredo. <clears throat> they unearthed the city that they say was in existence 1,000. There's a brother named Robin Walker who wrote a book called When We Ruled. 
He has a piece on it. Even, even if you Google Aredo, you'll, it, it'll come to you. It's in Nigeria. Now, 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 just check this out if you can get to this. Here's a city in Nigeria that was up and running 1000 AD. Wow. It's a walled in city, which means that it has ramparts. Ramparts are 75 feet high, which is like about seven and a half story building high. 400 square mile circumference. That's like a city that's from New York to Boston. Mm -hmm. That's how big it was. It had public baths, libraries, businesses. But here's what you gotta figure. It was up and running 1000 AD. How long did it take to build that city? Peace. Peace. You see, it's not just the city that you look at. You've got to look at all that goes back. How long did it take to build a 400 square mile city with all those different attractions with a rampart that went around the whole city? Timeline. But not just how long did it take to build the city. How long did it take to even fathom to build the city? Oh, wow. There you go. There you go. Not just that. How long did they have to study to even think they could do something like that? Yes. So what I'm saying to you that there are parts of West Africa that are as old as the Pyramid Age. But remember when someone take your history? Yeah. And they superimpose your history? Do you know what we could do with ourselves if we understood how great we really were? Now see, this is the Nigeria that all of them go into talking about how these people are primitive. Yeah. And they're walking into a city that they don't, they know not in Europe. And all the cities built in Europe, Africans from 710 to 1492 built them cities up. You can go to Cordova in Spain, 900 AD. Africans had built roads in Cordova where the sidewalks were raised, where people could walk and the streets were lit by lamps for miles. This is, our, this is in our DNA. The possibilities are in our DNA. Don't lose track of that. What they did, we can do. We have the pyramid blood in us. And so what this curriculum attempts to do is to develop an understanding of this. However, before this study guide was created, before this curriculum was created, the brother that had been coming to my presentations that uh, would later contact me to do this, he put together a 14 minute DVD celebrating President Obama's rise to the presidency. But I told him, you have to understand that in ancient Egypt, the place where the Neset Biti or the Pharaoh lived was called the White House. And then long before, you see, we get this thing about he the first black president. Well, he's not the first black president. But that's that's J. A. Rogers' work, five Negro presidents. And I, 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 and I can understand that. But what I'm saying is we need to go back to a point in our history when black men and black women rule the world. So my my contribution is in the ancient world to help us understand exactly where we come from, what our lineage is, what our epigenetic genius is. And don't ever forget that. And don't let the children conduct themselves in ways that we don't hold them accountable for the greatness that they possess. One of the things I used to always tell the children when they would conduct themselves a certain way, I say, you know better. <laughs> and I wasn't necessarily talking to them, I was talking to the ancestors in them. <laughs> you ancestor. Why are you letting him act like that? Mm. You know better. Peace. Bring that brother up where you need to. Bring that sister to a point where she needs to be. You know better. Excite that genius in that young person to make them calm that stuff down. And I think that what his presidency showed, as you know, there were things that he wanted to do that he could not do. There were things that he didn't do that we wished that he had done. There were things that we wish he had said that he did not say. We understand that. But the takeaway that I get from 
these past eight years was we were at a point to change the structure of the world. And this is why we have what we have now. This is white supremacy in the coffin with rigor mortis setting in. This is, this is why he's where he is. This is why we have the system that we have right now. Because when they saw where things were going, they said, we can't have this. This is over for us if we let this happen. And so the power that I come before you here in Harlem to talk about is to understand that we have to start doing something. No more talking. We have to start doing something. This is uh, the lesson plan that I contributed to this activity book. And it deals with the pyramids. And what becomes uh, so important about this is to understand two things. Dr. Uh, Wade Nobles, brilliant scholar from California, talks about what he considers to be content and intent when you're educating. Content is what you teach. Intent is how you teach it. It's methodology. There is a Moorish proverb that says, after you have learned what you set out to learn, you can discard what you learned because it was the process of learning it that was the greatest education. Mm -hmm. And what we learn in brain anatomy is that when we are learning something, what is actually happening is that we are connecting the nuclei of our neurons together. And that's really what makes us intelligent. It's not so much what you learn. For those who meditate, you know that you use a mantra, you use a word that you repeat constantly to get you down into a level of consciousness. The mantra is not important. It's getting down into your consciousness that's important. And what our ancestors did in Africa was that the purpose of, of everything that we do is to become conscious of our consciousness. So we use different disciplines to take us where we need to go. Math takes us. Science takes us. Language arts takes us. Those subjects are like the mantra. They're like what you repeat. It's what you look at to focus on to get deeper into your scholarship and your knowledge and your wisdom. Because when all is said and done, the only thing you take with you, once you're ready to leave this body, mm. is your consciousness. You ain't, you ain't taking out a dime with you. Jeez. You don't make a difference how many pairs of sneakers you have, Jeez. how many houses, houses you have. Who wrote you recommendation? God don't take recommendation letter from nobody. <laughs> Why? Because you are God having a human experience. So you know your heart. And I could get into the science of the liberation, but that's my second book. I'm writing a book now titled Spirituality Before Religions. That's analyzing the texts of our ancestors on the walls of Kemet, the pyramid text, the coffin text, the book of the coming forth today by night. Well, yeah. well, yeah, we'll go to church now. <laughs> in church now. But now, see we, see, we are at the point where we realize that religions are organized spirituality. Religions are the children of spirituality. And the great majority of religions were created by a people who, not, who knew not the spiritual system of Africa. So what they did is they tried to codify it, and then they oppressed people to believe that religion because they didn't really understand it themselves. So they used the sword and the gun to make you believe. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes important that as we move through this process and we look at this, I'm going to walk you through it because time would not allow, but this is what I go around doing with different uh, systems, whether it's African-centered schools or whether I go in, if I'm invited by a public school or even a charter school. Mm -hmm. uh, wherever I'm invited, I realize wherever our children are is where I want to be. Mm -hmm. And so we, so we need to liberate them. And so this is looking at the pyramid uh, dynasties. How do we move to Okay, so now we go from Saqqara uh, to Giza, 
where we look at these pyramids and we give the content material. We, we talk about what it is. This, this is the what the pyramids are, okay? We're, we're not yet at methodology. So we're, we're talking about the uh, pyramids. And, and by the way, you know, there were over 81 pyramids. This was a walled in city. And these three walls, in, uh, these three pyramids in particular, uh, are, are in direct alignment of the three uh, uh, stars of Orion's belt. And all of the other pyramids all around actually are major stars within Orion's belt. Africans called it the Asar. They didn't call it Orion. They called it Asar. And so these are the three that are aligned with uh, the, the three uh, of uh, Orion's belt. Asar was the one of the gods. Right? Yes, Asar is, is, is one of the major. He, he's like the father of fathers. Okay. Okay. And then, you, and then you have the three. In fact, you know, the pyramids are as deep as they are tall, you know. Long before they built above ground, they were building underground. Mm. And they're built by Malcolm's, uh, um, uh, Earl Grant, who was Malcolm's friend. He's portrayed in the movie at the end of the movie, uh, Earl Grant. Uh, he got into uh, microwave technology. And we, we, we invited him in my early days in the district. We invited him uh, to come talk to us about uh, African history. And he showed us a picture of what the pyramids look like underground. And they're, they're, they're shaped. A lot of people believe that the pyramids were nuclear reactors. Mm. And that they, in fact, were able to draw the energy and the power from the sun. At the top of all the pyramids, they, they had what's called a black pyramidium. And that would draw the light and heat energy from the sun down onto the capstone. It would be then drawn down into the bottom of the uh, pyramid and preserved uh, for actual what, what could be considered power. There's, there's a solar book. energy. Say again? Like solar energy. It, it, in fact, it is solar yeah. energy and the blackness. And you see, when you look at solar energy, and I'm going to talk to you about solar energy as we move through this, we have to be teaching our children solar energy. The future wealth of our planet is solar energy, period. In Oklahoma, there have been major um, earthquakes. And as they started to study why Oklahoma, this particular section of Oklahoma, would have earthquakes, what they came to realize is that they're doing drilling. Fracking. Fracking, fracking. fracking for, for gas, but they're, they're also going down to get oil. Mm. Okay, so they're trying, and what's happening is that it's like when you stick your finger down your throat and you vomit. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what they're doing to the earth. Mm -hmm. There's going to come a time when there will be no more. You will not be able to draw from the earth any more power. No more energy. You're not going to use fossil fuel. And what is fossil fuel? Black. Black coal. It's black. That's why oil looked the way it looked. Mm -hmm. And it's the fossil fuel of all the organic living systems that have been underground, put under great pressure. That, pre that creates an energy. And solar power is the power of the future. That's where our ancestors were. We have gone back in time as opposed to forward. And we have got to start to uh, teach our children solar power. And to do that, what I do is I introduce this book on the sun. One of the first things we can do is just introduce the sun to the children. Just get a book on the sun and start to teach them. Start to teach her about the sun, the parts of the sun, the photosphere, the chromosphere, the core. Then what you do is there's a, uh, a, a, a series of books. One of them that I have is called um, Solar Power. This is what we can bring into our classrooms, into our homes, teach our children about solar power. What is solar power? Because one of the things about solar power is the, the solar panels that draws that light and heat energy from the sun are black. A couple years ago, we had a serious snowstorm. We had a bad winter two or three years ago. One of the things that was sold the most, something that made a lot of money, black dirt. Why black dirt? Because when you put black dirt on snow, the blackness of the dirt drew the light and heat energy of the sun and it melted the ice. Blackness is what uh, captures and absorbs 
light and heat energy. Please, brother, did you want to know? No, I was just smiling. I said, could you elaborate a little bit on how was it that the black earth was able to melt the snow? What was the deposit within the black earth, it, the it, black dirt that made it possible? It, the, the blackness of the dirt that you put, because you, you, know, you have brown dirt and you have salt. But the black dirt, the blackness of the dirt, when the, when the sun shone, no matter how cold it was, it came down, the black dirt drew the light and heat energy right. that melted the snow. Right. That's that's so they calculated the heat. Heat. Black, that's, 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 that's right. right. Energy. Exactly. No. You see? Yes. Okay. Solar power. Here's another book that I have. Harness it. How to invent new ways to harness energy. We have to learn how to harness energy. We have to understand renewable energy. I work with a brother out in Sacramento. This brother literally helps children. He has an organization where children are drawing, are creating solar panels and attache cases. This is very real, family. This ain't, this isn't something come, but the question is what are we gonna do about it? That's what it is. Okay, I can say it, but this brother's doing it. Marcus Klein is doing it. What are we doing, okay? Brother here, Harlem Liberation School, sister, who is working. We have to do something. No more talk. We, 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 we have to roll back our sleeves and dedicate this time to make this happen. And each and every one of us, in our own way, whatever it is that you do well, give that to the community, whatever it may be. Now there's a series of books coming out of Capstone, Capstone Publishing. It's about a brother named Max Axiom. They, he, they have a library of 29 books, but what I brought to you today out of this library that I have are the books that pertain to solar energy and the pyramids, you see, because this is what we're talking about. Now here's where we can read about it. Here's the science behind it, the math behind it. With this curriculum and this, this is the combination that creates the school that we want. But first, as Sister said earlier, we as the adult population gotta learn this too. We weren't exposed to this growing up. Like I said, my blessing was being exposed to people such as Dr. John Henry Park and Dr. Ben and Dr. Asa Hillier, who at a young age was able to get into my head before the lies started getting up in there. And that's why I dedicated myself to the children. That's why I spent my life with the children. No, no matter what was going on, I dedicated my life because I realized it was them that I wanted to be with before the lies are written on the chalkboard to their mind and they had to erase it, I wanted to be the first writing on their wall. Because as we grow and mature, there's a lot of stuff we have to start erasing. Like for instance, did you know, this is, this is what I just saw, did you know that they found bones of a black woman in San Diego that's dated 90,000 years? I mean, are you aware? Are, are you aware that the indigenous people, the Native American people that claim to be indigenous, they're not the original people? That they are the fifth migration that escaped the Mongolian invasion and then came to America? That the first, in, the first American people were short stature people? Dark complexion, curly hair, wide nose, thick lip, known as Twa people or Mbuti? derogatorily called pygmy. Those were the first people on the American continent. There's evidence of them in South America, in Tierra del Fuego, the southernmost part of South America. If you don't believe me, just go look at a book. It's called The First Americans Were Africans and look at the cover. And the brother that's on that cover, he was the Native American they found in South America at Tierra del Fuego, which is the southernmost part of South America. The first peoples of America were Africans. The second were a taller stature African people known as Clovis Fosa. The third were the Algonquin, also African people. The fourth migration, they were the people that are known as the Inuit, or who we derogatorily call Eskimo. Mm -hmm. And then the fifth are known as the, as the, as the Mongolian Asiatics. How, how, did they get, how did they get here during the migration? Came across the Bering Strait. The, the first people came across the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. That's another thing. 
This bearing straight thing, the only reason why they use the bearing straight is because they have evidence coming across and the people coming across were the ones that were of a lighter complexion or de less pigmentation. So that's why they try to get people to believe that those were the first people that came here. Mm -hmm. The first people that came here came by boat from Africa. Now, you know how much erasing I had to do on our minds to get that across? Be because we would never think something like that. That would never enter our minds. We're thinking of Cochise, Tecumseh. Yet every day we say that the first thing that Europeans called the indigenous people that they met, they called them red. And the first thing that the indigenous people called them was pale. So there had to be a stark difference between the complexion of these people. And when you mix all the different colors that would eventually come here, you have the original people who were black. Capstone, Max Axiom, he's a brother, superhero scientist, a book on light, a book on scientific method, a book on renewable energy, a book on energy, magnetism, and electricity. These are principles that are going to go back to helping the children. So these are the library books you have in the classroom or in your home when you're teaching the children about the pyramids. Now here's where you get into methodology. Now this is what I developed as it relates to. Now with everything that I said. Brother, I'm sorry. Please. Quick question. Please. Because this stuff is so provocative. Can we, is that for sale also in this curriculum? This is for sale, but through the folk in Indianapolis. But yes, it is. But the other piece is that this is what I teach. You know, this is part of this book. This is part of this book. This is an excerpt that I took out of this book dealing with uh, the pyramids. Okay? So yes, it is. But this is what's in the Indianapolis public school system. This is what is in uh, Marcus Klein's uh, Freedom Home Academy. Uh, this can be in any school, anywhere. But what I want to show us is, this is real. That's what I want. When, when, when we leave here today, I want each and every one of us to leave here to know we can do this. We don't need them. Say that again, brother. That's what I want us to say. We don't need them. Yes, we never needed them. It's been an illusion that we needed them. Dem come from the Ice Age. <laughs> dem, dem are people, not just from the Ice Age, but let's be real, because there's some folk that look like us that are our worst enemy also. Yeah. And now we're going to break this down real. We have to get the paralysis out the analysis. We have to love our people. I love our people unconditionally. I know we're hurt on many different levels, but there are some people named Stephen, for those of you all who saw Django, <laughs> Named Stephen, who loved Massa more than Massa loved himself. What's the matter, boss? We see. That's it. <laughs> Our house on fire. All right. This is Malcolm talking to us. Yes. We have to face it. We have to love them. I love them. And I know you've been through a lot of pain, and they've done mess with your head so much. You know, in Django, there was a scene where they talked about, he said, um, uh, that this is Leonardo DiCaprio's character. He said, you know, there's a part of the brain that make these uh, uh, people slaves. And they'll never be anything else. They'll love me more than I love myself. This is in Django, I'm paraphrasing what's going on. But you know, that place exists in the brain, it's called the amygdala. And the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the place of the long-term memory. Right. The amygdala is the house of fear, the house of emotion. Mm. What they got, when they got those that were able to be enslaved, what they were able to control was the amygdala of that person's brain. Our brothers and sisters who love them more than they love themselves, their amygdala is impacted. For us in here, for you to take time out of your evening to be here, your amygdala is free or in the process of being free. <laughs> I'm still working on mine too, so I'm, I'm not coming here as no saint. Because I can't help but be a product of my environment. A lot of time I hold, I say, wait a minute now. What would John Henry Clark say about that thought? 
but I'm a human being. So, you know, we have, that's why I say we have to forgive ourselves. Because we're a product of our environment by matter of degree. That's right, program. We can't help it. Right? But, you know, when I'm thinking about money, I'm thinking about paying rent, uh, paying college <laughs> loans, <laughs> you know, putting food on. All of us are doing this. And in the back of our minds, we're fighting ourselves. We're angry that we have to go through this. And, and sometimes in that depth of hatred, we, we're not courageous enough to deal with the problem. So we start to take out on people that look like us what we should be doing for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's what creates we who hate ourselves, who do damage to other black folk. It's because you're not courageous enough to check yourself. So you'd rather take it out on someone that looked like you because that's how you did it. That's how you hurt yourself. And we have people that are like that. So when we say them, I'm speaking of the forces of oppression. I'm not talking about someone's culture. I'm not talking about white people. Because I know that that's not the enemy. The greatest enemy we have is not white people. The greatest enemy that is on a human is ignorance. Ignorance gives birth to twins. Fear, false evidence appearing real, and denial. Fear and denial breeds inferiority and insecurity, and that gives birth to white supremacy. So it becomes important that you can't win a battle if you don't know who your enemy is. Because sometimes your allies and your friends are the very ones that you think are your enemies. <laughs> as opposed to the ignorance that that person has that doesn't allow them to do what's necessary. And that ignorance comes in all different complexions, all different backgrounds. Dr. Uh, Edward Scobie, brilliant scholar, we don't call his name, Edward Scobie, a brother from uh, Dominica, phenomenal thinker. He used to always say, Booker T. This is prior to my, my name correction. He said, Booker T. Don't tell me nothing about no good white people. <laughs> he said, because good white people act as shields for the bad ones. Oh. Mm -hmm. He said, I know they're out there, but I'm not going to spend no time looking for them. Because I'm too busy looking for you. <laughs> <laughs> and that made a lot of sense because, you know, we all do know there are good people in all cultures. Mm -hmm. We know that. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, Mm -hmm. There are a thousand wolves outside your door. You know there's a hundred out there that would give their life to protect you. A hundred would protect you out of that thousand. The problem is, is my question. The problem is you don't know where those 100 are in that room. Mm -hmm. Are you ready to go out? Not me. Well, and so that's the story I talk about when I talk about people who say, well, I don't feel that way. I'm like, well, I understand you don't. But if you really want to help us, go back in your own community and talk to some of them people that you be having dinner with. We know what to do for ourselves. We don't need you. We need you to talk to them crazy people out there in your neighborhoods. And so as we, as, as we move through this family, I just want you to understand that this curriculum does exist. This is the science activities. And of course, then you have the, you know, the way you break it down in, in curriculum development, you have choose from several <coughs> options to reinforce the information presented. In this case, the method of delivery is student-generated products. The procedure in the curriculum that's going to teach about the pyramids, the teacher has the procedure. The procedure will, that the teacher will have students read or listen to the background information sheet, the one that just preceded. Have students use the vocabulary sheets and focus on words in section four. See, this is the teacher guide. That's, that the teacher or the parent that's teaching the child is going to be looking at. I want to go down because time doesn't allow. Here's the student will. This is what we expect of the student. So that as I'm doing staff development with people, 
Teachers know what to expect from the teacher. They know what to expect from the students. The student will read or listen to the background information. They will complete a vocabulary activity using the words listed in section four. Now you see, the thing about it is that what you expect from the students has to reflect back what you expect the teacher to do. So you can see in number one, the teacher will have students read or listen. The student will, number one, read or listen to. In number two, have students use vocabulary sheets in section four. Number two, with the students, complete a vocabulary activity using the words listed in four. So there's a relationship between what the teacher expects, what the student expects. So when you go into the classroom to teach this, or if you're teaching it in your home, you are prepared because you've already, it's like a recipe. I call this like a recipe. When you're ready to cook something, you follow what the recipe, the recipe tells you what the ingredients are, the recipe tells you how to cook them, it gives you the time to cook it, it directs you as to what you're gonna do. This is what a curriculum guide does here. It guides the adult teacher to understand what is expected of him or her and expected of the student or the uh, uh, child learning. We go down now here, in, in next one is we go from science, now we're in geography. And now we have a map study program. Over here, activity two, we have geometry and art, drawing 3D pyramids. Activity three, here's where the mathematics problem is. Okay? Here's the vocabulary. This is what we expect the students in terms of vocabulary. This is the vocabulary, the, the word buildup, to put these words into the children's vocabulary. Now here's another science astronomy activity. And again, the teacher, the student will draw a pyramid in 3D. Come down to number five, astronomy in the pyramids. Number six, language arts, writing assignment, research project. See, see, what I want us to understand, family, is that this is doable. And I, and I speak to us who are teachers and who are not teachers. Because you see, in so many ways, I'd like to do this with you as the adults who may never have gone through this before. This is a good lesson for you to learn, too, if you have never been introduced to this. Because when you know this, then you know how to teach it to the children. But if we've never gone through it, how can we teach something we don't know? Language arts, writing assignment, social studies, here we got the timelines. Evaluation questions. Here's some geography maps up there. Final wrap up question, student reflection and debriefing. Teacher reflections, resources if you want more, extended activities, and another set of questions. So that what, what becomes important as we do this is um, natural resources. All that you saw was pre-computer. All of these were pre-computer. Okay? All of it was developed along those lines. Click on the one behind it and hit the red, up there, hit that red, yeah, hit that. This was the introduction. 
And by the way, it was dedicated to the life and works of Professor William Leo Hansberry. Now, what's important about Professor William Leo Hansberry was that I did two of my papers on him, two of my master's thesis I did on William Leo Hansberry. One paper I did on his life and his work, and the other I did when I did my education uh, thesis, I did it on how he developed a black studies and African studies program in 1923 at Howard University. How did he do that? With everything that they were coming at him, how did he do that? And so this evening, what I've done is I brought as my book honoring Professor William Leo Hansberg because because this brother, when you study what he did in his life, it sort of kind of stops us from ever complaining. Mm. I have never had a hard day. <laughs> and if I did, I'd be so embarrassed to think I'm having a hard time. Compared to what he did, free, free wife, two daughters, and everything that was coming at him. Please, brother. Uh, two questions. First question is, is he the father of Lorraine Hansen? Uncle. Uncle. L Lorraine Hansberry's father was his brother, Carl. Oh, okay. Carl with a C. Carl Hansberry was Lorraine Hansberry's, uh, uh, Carl was L L Lorraine's father. And Carl and William were brothers from and Gloucester, Mississippi. Okay, and my second question is, um, Brother Hill hosts a program by uh, Brother Q. Butter called Educating Us. And some of us in this room are proponents of us educating our, our own kids. And Brother Taimba has been a panelist on that discussion. So my question is, um, what age group do you propose this, um, this curriculum for? Is this for the junior high school level? Or what age group would you propose this for? When we worked this out, we went through all the grades from pre-kindergarten to high school. But, but there are sections that veer off according to the grade that you're teaching. So that there might be certain, what I showed you basically was like a middle school approach. Okay. But with uh, early, earlier grades then you'd have more motor skill. For instance, one of the things that we need to do in our math class, you see, everything that happens psychologically happens through your sensory perception what you hear, what you see from a little baby child. If you look at a child, you give something to a child, the child will smell it, try to eat it, hit itself up the head, okay? It'll, it, it'll test all of its senses to figure out what this is. From when our children are born, they are bombarded with images that are unlike themselves. And many times, the ones that are considered to be most beautiful are the ones that look least like them. Exactly. And so what I've worked with over the years is developing a way in which we can create images that are for us to view. And so in our math classes, having been a kindergarten teacher, first grade teacher, I know that children count bears and they count balloons and they count. And so what I decided is, no, we're not going to do that. So I went into business with another business that develops and has comedic symbols such as the mask of King Tut, or the Bastet Black Cat, or Three Pyramids, or the Three Pyramids, or the Scarab Beetle. This is how we can teach our children how to count, using these, because this is their culture. So when they're counting, everything they're counting is reflecting back on them, as opposed to balloons and bears and and, and mice, and then we want to get upset when the first thing they want to do is go to Disney World. Mm. But we've embedded those images in them. That's right. So that's the only, and I don't blame them. I want to go to Disneyland too. You see? And that's why I encourage us to have books and things for our community. So the one thing that we need to have are images that we can have in our home where children see themselves. When you have an activity, you go to a, a, a bookstore or wherever, you get a book on African-American heroes and sheroes. You reduce them down. So when they're counting, have them count pictures of Malcolm X or Harriet Tubman or Sojourner Truth. 
you, you can do this yourself. Just you, you get a big picture and just start to reduce it by Xerox. When you get it enough where you can fit 10 of them on a page, cut and paste. And so children start counting. You can even take pictures of the children. That could be a homework assignment. Once you show them Malcolm X or Madam C.J. Walker or Harriet Tubman, say, okay, I want you to go home now and get a picture of yourself. And then we're going to do an activity where we're going to have, I want you now to do flashcards where you can put their picture on the flashcard. You see, everything has to re go back to them as opposed to the outside world. These are the little things I do with staff development sessions that show people. But you could have done that all the while. It's just that sometimes that thought, that image wasn't introduced into your mind. It's, it's not that you have done anything wrong. It's just that you've not been introduced. In Africa, that would be the automatic way you do it. Please, Brother Rebus. Um, Just a question. Your um, curriculum, have you pitched that here? Here? No. New I York, here. New York. York. No. New York. No. No. No, and, and, and why? Because my experience in the Board of Education, Brother Rebus, and I'm not speaking about the individual schools, I'm, 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 I'm talking about blanketly. Whenever I have introduced an idea, the way in which the people received it, I ended up wishing I never said a word. Mm. Because I don't know if, I don't know if they're ready. When I say they, I'm talking about people that are not us. See, man, they don't want to help us. We are vehicles by which they can make money. And I don't believe that in the very essence of who they are, they're trying to get to a day. Now, I have worked with teachers such as yourself and others who are in the system have brought together a consortium of teachers that are interested in how can I bring this into the classroom. Uh, I've worked with after school programs, I've worked with martial arts uh, academies that have an after school program, they teach a little martial arts, they teach a little culture, they teach you know, homework and things like that, a little snack. But I, I've gotten to the point where because I am where I am right now, I want to be with you. That's why I've dedicated my life to us now. Because you spend so much time, and, and I've done it, man. In the beginning, I used to go out. Even when I was working for the Board of Ed, I used to travel around the country, and I used to work in, in, in Florida, Broward County. I used to work in, in Detroit. I used to work places. And, man, the people would give me so much argument. Like, when, I, when we first did this piece in uh, Indianapolis, what's the first thing they said? Oh, this is political. I said, you missed the whole point. <laughs> You're so busy not wanting to do it, you're looking for an excuse not to do it. So the littlest thing that's going to come up, you're going to use not to want to do this. So what I did is I met with teachers that wanted to do it. I said, let's work with schools that want to implement it. So there were dynamic schools that were being led by brothers and sisters, principals that said, I don't care what she said, you come on in here and work with my staff. So that's who I want to work with. I want to work with people who are ready because we don't have time. There's stuff happening out here. We gotta get this in place so that the people that really want this, want this. So, you know, I know there's an uh, uh, area where you make money. So if I pitched it to people in general, you, you could make money, but I'm not into making money at this point. I'm, 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 I'm into somebody saying, wow, this is good, I like this. That's why I'm trying to talk to uh, Gary into looking at dealing with this on an individual level and not on boards of education levels. Because you're not gonna win over boards of education. But you certainly can win over groups of teachers that want to create a consortium that would like to apply this. And a brother like you, with your experience in math and science, you work with other teachers that may just be coming through the system. You say, well, this is what we can do. You can add things to this. I've had teachers add things to this. They say, well, you know, something else. Now that I look at it, there's a book that I have that can do it like this. And in these workshop sessions, we start doing stuff that we start building on what we're doing. But when you're with people who want to tear it down, they start taking you away from all this and then everybody get pissed off and everybody leave. And so that's what I find happening. So, so I, I, I pitched it, but to communities, to after school programs, to people that want to do it. A telescope. Yeah. And a microscope. Yeah. A telescope to see the outer world, a microscope to see an inner world. Let me advise you to do something. Don't make it expensive. 
Get something inexpensive. You, you, you don't need to see the Andromeda constellation. You can start with the moon. The moon is fine. <laughs> you know? Inexpensive. This is $10. Inexpensive. Don't get anything expensive. Uh, there are other things that I have that, that have multiple aspects to them, that they're binoculars and monoculars, and there's numbers of things that you can do with this one piece. But, I, but because of space, I brought the telescope with me today. Again, I've done business with businesses that do this. And so therefore, when I visit communities, um, I, um, child got one of these in Brooklyn. I did a presentation in Brooklyn. Parent got this. And um, the mother emailed me and said that the child, you, you, can't take the, you can't take the telescope from the child. The brilliant uh, scholar that now is the, uh, the curator of the planetarium, uh, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, he was introduced to it because he went up to his roof on the Bronx with a telescope and saw the moon. That, that, now he's an astrophysicist. We don't know who we have as our children around us, but like I said, it's an opportunity gap, not an achievement gap. If, if they don't have a telescope, they will not see that world. So therefore they won't know. Have any type of musical instruments in your home so that they can test their, their musical abilities. A little piano, maybe a little guitar. You know, I, I know drum, okay, but I know. But drum, you know, see, see where their talents are. You know, have them draw. Draw out of them. It's opportunities that we have to give to our children. But we have to supply the opportunity for them. So when you were talking about having a science center, I worked with a sister, uh, Latrella Thornton. Sister Latrella was running the early childhood center up at CCNY, okay? And she invited me in to, you know, to talk to her and to see. And what she had was in her early childhood center, which was for the children of the students and teachers of CCNY, is that she had learning centers where the, te the children were free to go wherever they wanted to go, but there was an adult in all of the rooms. So if a, you know, they had a science where they had little rabbits and birds and things like that and uh, uh, planets and things like that, so if children that were leaning towards science would spend a lot of time there. They had another room where it was a reading room. They had another room where there was a lot of physical activities. They, they had a, a, a math center. They, they, so what happened was that in exposing and, and, and letting children, it was exploratory. And even in the older grades, I used to set up learning centers when, when I was in the classroom. Learning centers where children could go where they wanted to go. I didn't force them to do anything. But what I was doing was I was observing them. And so when I saw Kwame always around the science center, then I said, well, he's leaning towards science. If I saw another student always in the reading center, then I knew that they were there. Which goes back to one of the first things that you were speaking to me about, my sister, and we have to understand multiple intelligences. And that's why I'm very, very focused in on images. Because I know that so many folk wear bow ties. So I said, well, why don't you wear a Malcolm X and Martin Luther King bow tie? So that when people are talking to you, the image is constantly, see, we have to, Amos was to say, no, wrong with propaganda. It's according to what your purpose is for. Exactly. You see, when you create, this goes into your, your mind, that even if you're not aware of it, you know, oh yeah, look at Martin, look at Malcolm X, wow, and look in the middle, it's Rosa Parks, wow. Okay, and, and you're looking, but you're talking to the person about something, but, the, but it's going in. A child is doing the same thing. In fact, the child is exploring you to see this. And so these images are constantly being brought, and this is what we have to do for our community, including the nit piece that I have on my head, the images that we have. Okay, we have one with geometric progressions, we have one, but what I am saying is that the images that we have to project constantly is constantly going back into our culture to put back those images that we lost when we came over here because they took our history, they took our language, values, interests, and principles. And then they put their own. And so now it's time for us to reverse it and to begin to take our images and begin to saturate our community with our images. Just as you said, to build this room so that when the children come in, they see themselves. They see pictures of themselves. Okay? So that they, they, they're not caught up in looking at other people. You see, so these are the things that we that we have to start to look at as it relates to where we're going. And again, it is someone like William Leo Hansberry who came to realize this. 
and it's someone like William Neal Hansberry that decided once and for all that he was going to do something about this. And the story of this man, I call an intellectual libation to the architect of black studies. Because what he went through laid the groundwork for what people like Dr. John Henry Clark and even myself, third generation, because Dr. Clark was a student of William Little Hansberry. Wow. I was a student of John Henry Clark. So I'm like third generation doing this. And I consider myself lucky, considering what I know he went through and what I know that Professor Clark went through to get that information. I'm lucky uh, compared to what they went through. Now, I have uh, brought some DVDs with me, uh, some incense, and I just want to talk a bit about my son, Heru, who I brought my son with me from when he was like in, in a stroller. You know, I used to do presentations. Sister Lori will remember when we used to go up to Peg Lake Bates. Yes, and, uh, that's going way back. Yeah, that's going back. Uh, you know, that's going back to the early 90s. In fact, I worked with the, um, with the, with, with the retreat that Alton Maddox and the um, United African Movement put in place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah Atlanta, yes, Capitol. exactly. And they, we, we used to have it up at Peg Lake Bay. Two weeks, we'd have the brothers come up. Two weeks, we had the sisters come up. The way in which I knew, I knew how long it had been was the year, the year we had our first retreat was the year that Haru was born, uh, 1994. And I remember uh, that he used to also have a summer and a, 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 a autumn and a spring retreat, where we, you know, he, he'd have a big, wonderful dinner in Brooklyn, and then buses would go up to Peg Leg Bates and. They'd all, uh, you know, we'd eat and we'd have workshops. And there were workshops that I would go and I would do a workshop on education. And then we'd break for lunch and I'd be uh, in what was called the, um, the cafeteria. He had the wall of fame where all the great people that had come up to Peg Lake Bates and performed. And I remember people that were in my workshop would come out and I'd be feeding Heru in the stroller. You know, because that's how far back it goes. But the point I'm making is this. There came a time as I began to bring him with me with five, five years old, six years old, seven years old. And he said, yo, dad, you know, with all this talk, you know, Hotep and Ankh and where, where is it in the clothes? And so I said, well, where you don't see something, do it yourself. And so he began to uh, do little things for himself and some of his classmates would like it and he'd start doing it. And, Long story short, pretty, made, pretty soon he made a business for himself. So I say that as partial commercial for him because he's got his t-shirts over there. Uh, and again, it is in reflection of the image that the younger generation wanted when they were exposed to the information, but they didn't see it around. And now you see there's a, a growth of this. And he also has an oil called the movement. And so this is our, uh, this is our business. And when you see those vendors in the street, family, you need to take 10% of your net income a month and spend it with the vendors. They're all small business. I don't believe in boycotting white business. I believe in buying out black. Because the only thing a boycott proves is you made a mistake supporting them in the first place. We should make our vendors have to go home early because they ain't got nothing else to sell. Buy them out. This is what we need to do. My sister, please, did you yes, want to say? Want please, to say sister something Laura. About, uh, something about um, the retreat. Uh, I, I, I worked on organizing the retreat. I worked on something. Uh, 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 it, was, it was going from, it was footwork. We didn't have modern technology. So we just did things going from person to person. People that we heard about the recommended to us. People who had resources, talents, ideas. It was really it was really organized. You know? yeah. It was really organized from the ground up. And I just wanted to say um, as you were speaking you reminded me that I used to take my uh, granddaughter that I was raising there 
from the time she was about um, maybe three, three years old. And um, in the dining room, there was a stage, because it had once been a nightclub, so there was a stage, and there was an old piano that um, uh, uh, um, performers used to use when they came up to, to, to give entertainment. And one day, my little granddaughter, she's about three or four, was uh, playing on the piano, just playing. And uh, the curtain was partially drawn so nobody could see her. So somebody said, oh, who, who was that? Who's got that? Who's playing, playing the jazz piece? So someone went and pulled back the curtain. I have a picture of her. And there she is sitting at the piano. She never had a lesson. Nobody taught her anything. But one of the people there said, you know, she's musically talented. And you need to start giving her some kind of lessons. And somebody there um, said, well, I'll, I'll give her lessons just free because I see the talent in her. And so now she's uh, almost 21 years old. And in April, she'll be um, singing in a group, in a jazz group, All right. uh, with this famous uh, brother who goes around the world with his jazz group. But now he wants her to be a part of it when he comes to New York City. And that's what can come out of things when we work together. It's all about our people and seeing something. That happens to other children too, of course, but I'm talking about my granddaughter. Yes, my grandmother took me to one of her friend's neighbor's house in the living room. She had a, a piano. And in the living room, she had a piano. So they went to the other room talking their, their stuff. So I sat there by the piano and I opened up the case and I just started messing with the tune with the keys. And I don't know what happened. I just started playing, you know. And um, the weird thing is that as my grandmother got older, she didn't know that was me playing. You know, she was like, I remember when I went to, I took it to, what's her name now? And somebody was playing that beautiful song. I was like, remember that was me. But you don't know how to play the piano. I know. But I still, I'm in tune with music because I DJ. So I even made a mix with Marcus Garvey out of Clean Power in the song, you know. But I figured that, you know, if you could memorize some dumb songs, what about drugs or whatever the case is, you could memorize, you know, a preaching, you know, or a teaching. All I do is just throw them a beat and make it sound hot, you know, but it's how you cut it up. You know, I'm a Pisces, so I got to do something with music. Is, music is not involved, neither am I, you know, point blank. So my thing is that I understand, I was like, wait a minute, I thought that was just me, you know. So when you sung that story, I was like, yeah, she got talent, you know, but that comes from the soul. You know, the soul can speak through strings. Strings used to heal people, you know. So when you hear music nowadays, there's no actual instruments. Everything is technical technical with, you know, so with the music nowadays, well back back in our days, it was drums, it was strings, you could feel it, vibes and the frequencies. You don't have that now. So I'll be a little uh, fan of the group to support, you know, the lady. Thank you for your time. No doubt. Hotel. And you know, you know, you know I'm a, you know I'm gonna end with this with the point that both have been made. I've done research uh, on Ludwig von Beethoven. And of course we know he was an African, but the point I'm gonna make with our children, with opportunity and everything else, and the inner genius. The story of Beethoven, his father Johannes, his grandfather was Ludwig. His father's name was Johannes Beethoven. Ludwig von Beethoven was, his family saw talent in him and the family moved from Bonn, Germany to Vienna, Austria. And they wanted to have a meeting with Amadeus Mozart. And he met with Amadeus Mozart. He thought his son would be a protege. Now a protege is a young genius. Amadeus said, he's not gonna be a young genius. He is a great musician, but he's not a young genius. He's not a protege. And Ludwig von Beethoven would be playing, practicing, playing the piano, and he would go off, off the page, off the script. The father would come out knowing music. He said, I told you, stay on, this, stay on the script. Don't waver. He said, but I hear this music in my head. 
And so he started playing what he heard in his head. Father said, forget about what's in your head. You play what's on the paper. You play those notes. He would play and all of a sudden he would go off again. Father would come out, beat him. Long story short is by the age of 30, Ludwig von Beethoven was deaf. But some of his greatest pieces, like the Ninth Symphony, was done after he was deaf. And the reason why it was done was because the music, like Stevie Wonder says, music in my mind. Yeah. You see, the arts and everything are in your mind. Your genius is in your mind. You're born with your genius. It's our, it's our job to assist each and every one of our students or our children right. to find the genius within, to allow them to embellish and enhance it. We're living in a society that's demanding, if you want to make a living, you better do this. As opposed to having that child search for his or her gift. And so Ludwig von Beethoven's gift was in his head. He heard the music in his head. So the Ninth Symphony was something that wasn't written on a piece of paper. It was in his head. And so many of our, chi our children who are exposed to different things find that they are geniuses, but never realized it. Had she never gone to the retreat, would Leonora maybe ever play the piano? Would someone hear it and say that? It was she was in a certain place with certain people, and all of a sudden now, she's a jazz singer. How many of our children are, are mathematicians or scientists who are exposed to a telescope or exposed to something that once exposed start to do it? We have to expose our children, but let me end with this. Don't give up on yourself either because there are geniuses and passions within yourself that you have yet developed. So don't give up on yourself because it ain't over till we win. That's right. That's you, know, it, you know, it ain't over till it's over. So understand that the creator is never finished with you until you're ready to go six feet under. And until that time, who knows what the future holds? That's right. I say.